Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Mike Steckline, partner with Institute for Enterprise Excellence. Got a great presentation today. A couple of colleagues, uh, friends uh, you'll be learning from and learning with. And um, the topic is uh, we've decided to call it Lessons of a Failed Sensei. Sensei. And we'll be getting into that uh, shortly as we get into our presentation. Uh, just a few um, housekeepings and uh, background uh, ground rules here. Uh, the phones are going to be muted, uh, except for our presenters. Uh, there are some times where we're going to take a break for doing some Q&A, and uh, you'll have a chance to weigh in on what, our, what we're talking about. You can also use the chat function, so you can type in any questions or input that you have. And this webinar is being recorded, so you and others can take advantage of uh, what we talk about today at a time that is uh, convenient for you and for others. And uh, feel free to share that as we distribute the link, and uh, you, uh, you others will be able to benefit from that as well. So as I said, the topic is Lessons of a Failed Sensei. Uh, put this together with uh, friends and colleague Dirk Van Rossum and Angie Swenson. And uh, as they get into it, they'll be talking a little bit about who they are and what they do. Uh, Dirk has done a, a couple of these webinars before. I think, Angie, this is your first one to, to actually do with us. So appreciate both of them putting together the time and, and um, talking about this. Uh, by way of background, I just put together a little calendar here uh, to describe how we got into this and also to share that uh, sometimes these things take some time to, um, to formulate, and, and that's fine. So uh, what happened was uh, we were exchanging some emails and said, hey, I have an idea for a white paper or a webinar. Are you interested? And um, a few people said, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. And uh, then, uh, of course, some time passed and said, hey, Mike, you still interested in that? Oh, sure. Let's, let's talk about that. And both Dirk and Angie um, expressed interest to actually develop something with me. And then over time, what we did was we listed what are the different questions that we have or the different themes that we talked about relative to uh, the role of a sensei and what that means. And so uh, the little diagram there on the left-hand side just describes some of our working documents that we had as far as possible themes and content that we wanted to share around this question. Um, and this idea of a failed sensei, uh, we had different names for what we wanted to call it. Essentially, it was about... You know, you try things, things don't always necessarily work out. What did you learn? What would you do differently if you could do it differently? And um, so we developed these themes, and then we came up with um, a time and today's date to do the webinar. So it took a little bit of time. And we talked a little bit about amongst ourselves as far as who's the, the, the target audience for something like this. And to describe this uh, in one of the white papers that that we put together talk about side-by-side -side management and this idea of looking at the org chart and uh, tilting it 45 degrees um, counterclockwise. And if you looked at it that way, uh, you can think about there are leaders in an organization. There's people that are managers that report to those leaders. And then there's people at the front line that are delivering value to the customers uh, that report to the managers in a general framework. Uh, so who could benefit from this presentation? Certainly any of those folks could, could benefit from this. Um, in many organizations, there's internal advisors, people that play a role to advise whether your leaders, managers, or frontline and how to apply these concepts and these uh, principles. And then there's external advisors, people that are not a part of the organization, but they have knowledge and perspective to add, and uh, they too can play a role when we think about uh, this role of a sensei. So to think about this, I'm borrowing something from um, John Shook uh, when he was with the Lean Enterprise Institute, um, still is in a, in a way. Um, and this diagram uh, he would use and others would use would talk about the role of a lean leader. And I thought about this um, in, in terms of our agenda for what we're gonna be talking about. And so um, we'll, we'll just review what, what are we going to talk about in this presentation and the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, where to start and how long is the race. So that's one uh, bit of time that we're going to be talking about. And Angie and Dirk are going to be sharing some thoughts. And then we'll have some time for you folks to share your thoughts as well. And another topic was how to run the race. And also, what is the role of a sensei uh, relative to this uh, um, 
objective of trying to learn and apply these principles. Um, another topic is uh, engaging senior leadership and uh, how does that work for someone that's either inside an organization or external to an organization, that important role of um, really trying to help leaders understand what they um, can do differently, the kinds of things they need to learn about. And then a topic that we just talked about, um, troubles within the, the department if you're part of an internal department and both the application of these principles but also organizing the work around how does this make sense, um, how do you do this. And um, so those are some of the topics we're going to be talking about. Now to get it kicked off, um, this is a slide that Angie put together and I'm going to turn it over to her and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, this concept and then uh, Dirk is going to have a slide and then we're going to have uh, round it out back to me. So Angie, take it away. Thank you, Mike. And good morning or afternoon to everyone on the call, depending on where you're at. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this. So the first thing that we wanted to start with is actually how do you start, you know, your lean journey or your continuous improvement journey? Where is actually the start line? And how long is the race that you're looking at? Are you going for a sprint or something a little longer? And so when you start asking these questions within the organization or leadership asks these questions within the organization, there's a couple of different ways um, that you can go about it. So you can have a top-down approach where executives say, we're going to use Lean or Six Sigma or whatever continuous improvement um, model that you're using. Or it can come somewhere within middle management, or it can actually be initiated by the front line. There's also transformation versus small experiments versus a project approach. And there's also, do you go where leadership has indicated they want to fix problems? So maybe they're not meeting metrics or goals in certain areas. Or do you actually go where the leaders that run and operate those areas are interested? So those are three different high level and big considerations um, when you're thinking about how to launch and go about it. And as Mike mentioned, this is um, a presentation on what we've experienced and what some of the failings and successes have been. And I have been able to be a part of all of the different options on this page. And so one of the things that I wanted to share is that there are successes and failures within each of these decisions. Um, and so when I was part of an organization where it was from top down, the very senior executive CEO for the hospital said we would like to do this, um, go. That was awesome because that was the way it is. So I had full support in starting from the ground up a lean continuous improvement department and I was also able to be part of the executive team because of the buy-in from our CEO. So then I was able to be aware of all of the different things that were going on within the hospital to make sure that I wasn't doing anything with competing interests. I also was able to know timelines of other projects. Um, so that, that was very effective. Um, for those reasons, but it also was had some problems as far as when you're down working with the teammates um, and actually working in their spaces, if we didn't communicate well or if we didn't create that buy-in or if the middle management um, was not on board, then we had less success in those areas. Also, um, at the front line, um, when I was involved in frontline work, the successful, some of the success we see at that level is this is actually where the learning and speed can happen and people are putting in place um, the improvements. And that's fantastic, but if we go in with complex tools and don't create the buy-in and create the relationships, then we can have failings there. And if our transformation work or our project work or whatever type of work starts with the front line, I have found myself in positions where middle management and executives do not pay attention to the good work that's happening. They don't recognize it um, and they don't provide support 
sometimes in the way of money. So not all of our solutions require money, but sometimes they do. And it was really hard to get that. So recognition and um, funding were issues when we started at the front line. Starting in middle management has both problems with lack of upper management buy-in and lack of um, frontline engagement, depending on how successful that middle management or those middle leaders are. So that's entirely dependent on them. The next part of this is transformation versus small experiments versus projects. Um, I've had an excellent success with transforming an entire organization, but that had to be combined with the top down, um, the executive level driving this. It would be nearly impossible to do this with just middle management and not possible with just frontline based on my experience. If others have different experience, please, when we get to the Q&A or the sharing part, please bring that discussion to the table. I've also been a part of, because I've been doing this a while, I've been a part of organizations where they really just wanna look at this in a project-based way versus transformation. And of course, we can have successes and failures in that arena as well. Some of the successes I've seen is the speed with which the work gets done. Um, people are not as, were not as afraid of me coming into their space when they knew I was project support versus there to change the way they function and, and think and, and improve. Areas where leadership has indicated they want fixed. Um, I've been in several of these positions. And what I found is that if executives say, hey, go work in the ED, somehow that does not trickle all the way down to the ED leaders and their team members. And they've looked at me like, why are you here? Who are you? What are you doing here? Nope, we're fine. See you later. Um, so that has been one of the potential failures is there's a hard start then. Um, it's, it's hard to get going. It takes longer to get going because you really have to build that trust and you have to communicate as the sensei why you're there and how you'd like to partner with them and learn their work. Um, so that has been a challenge in my career um, just because we haven't done, we haven't connected well from executive leaders down to the workspace. If we've, if when I've been in work where areas where the leaders are interested, that has been awesome. We have been able to move quickly. We've been able to develop people. We've been able to get results. So that has been great. But then usually those are the areas that are not performing as poorly. So those are just some of my experiences and during this discussion would be happy to see what others have experienced. Great. Um, Dirk's going to talk a little bit about this slide here. All right. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, at the start line, how to go about running the race to, to kind of build on what uh, Angie was talking about. You know, one of the things I think we fall into a trap in, especially for me earlier on in my career, is I like tools. You know, I'm an engineer, so I like tools, whether it's fixing or working on my bicycle or fixing a car or whatever, and same in an organizational context. So it's easy to kind of, you know, be um, fall in love with the tool and then want to apply that in every situation. And I found that that doesn't always work. Um, even though a tool like 5S has got, got great merits and oftentimes a transformation plan includes starting with 5S, if, if I found in, in, in from experience that if you do 5S at the frontline level, but the manager's office is a mess, that really sends a mixed message. So you need to be really careful about how you how you approach that uh, uh, particular situation, and and that's why uh, you'll you'll hear me saying that a lot of this is very context based, just as what uh, Angie was talking about previously. Um, what is the situation, and how do we adapt to that situation? You know, um, talking about uh, approach applicability and fixing what isn't visibly broken. For instance, early on in my career. 
Uh, we had a top-down approach, which was great, but we had a very rigid implementation path that was being followed. This, this was in a manufacturing context. So it was all about uh, mapping the process, connecting the process, identifying the constraints, and then attacking the constraints, and then pursuing perfection. Um, as long as the um, top-level management support and demand was there for this approach, uh, we made good progress. But as soon as the organization leadership changed and the emphasis slipped, this approach didn't work any longer. Um, so we had to find a different way. So introduced back to the first point, a new tool, value stream analysis or value stream mapping came along. So this was really great. And that helped us to kind of build a new track and, and uh, build up momentum again based on uh, what we'd done previously because it helped under, uh, define why we were doing things which were kind of missing in the earlier rigid approach that had been applied. So here's a key point. Uh, we need to make the why very clear. Um, however, as you move into different situations, and as, as I've had different experiences in the organizations that I've worked in, even though value stream analysis and value stream mapping has extreme power as a diagnostic tool and a starting point for transformation and improvement work, um, oftentimes the stability isn't there or the need isn't there to start with that. Um, there might be a found resistance. People didn't understand what it was about and refused to do value stream mapping exercises. But fortunately, they had other needs. So as, as, a, as, a, as a coach, if you can then tease that out, you can still work there to bring about something good with the team and teach them some things at the same time, and then revisit the whole value stream mapping approach later on. So that, that, that's uh, some comments just about the applicability of tools and also fixing what isn't broken, right? So if you want to go in and uh, approach something with a particular tool or, you know, you want to uh, implement standard work, which has merit as such, but what is the problem you're trying to fix? Is that problem visible? Um, and I've made that mistake in the past before, I'm trying to do something when the problem isn't readily apparent to the participants that actually own the area. So as, as a sensei walking in, it might be apparent to you, but they don't see it. So then our job is really to help them discover that. Um, the incomprehensibility of change and, and, and the, the vagueness of vision are, are two other things. To, uh, you know, when you, when you start a journey like this, to get people to understand what it encompasses and how large this is, and what a cultural change this actually is, it's difficult to grasp for people that are unfamiliar with the content. Um, but there is a lot of content to it, and all of it matters, and it all ties together. So then it becomes really important to have a simple story that tells uh, the, the um, audience what this really is about, and together with that, create a simple but compelling vision to move forward. And that's the trap I've fallen into in the past is that, you know, because of the uh, comprehensive nature of, of the transformation, um, it's often difficult to see the forest or the trees. Um, so to keep it simple, I think is, is, is really important there. Um, another thing with that that goes with it is, you know, do you want to go linear with your approach or do you want to build it um, in a uh, more customized fashion? based on conditions in the ground. I think that that's another important distinction. Uh, there isn't necessarily one fixed implementation path that has to be followed. There's a lot of content that needs to be put in place eventually, but necessarily not uh, in a rigid uh, sequence. Um, so you need, to, you need to consider what is happening on the ground there. Um, another factor an issue is that, you know, with regards to roles and ownership, is there's often a misunderstanding as to um, what the role of the Lean Transformation Office, the Lean Senses, and so forth is. If there's a perception that, you know, you're just there to do projects, et cetera, then it's going to make it really difficult to provide guidance for an actual transformation, um, as well as who owns the transformation. You know, as, as Angie mentioned earlier, you know, really, the ownership for a transformation of the culture, of how people think and function in the organization, it belongs with the leadership of the organization. 
um, the Lean Sensei and Transformation Team's responsibility is simply to help guide that process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, in a little bit more detail further on. Um, and then, you know, with, with all these things, you're at risk of, you know, falling into the futility of fumbling about, right? So what can happen is that, and I've experienced is that lean activities are on the periphery of the central business. It's not integrated into any overall strategy. Um, there is a lack of clarity on how much time to spend on it. Time isn't made available to work on it. Um, things like, you know, certain tools, the complexity of tools at the front line becomes overwhelming. So then there's a, a tendency to dilute the application of the tools um, and dilute the, the uh, implementation process, which then leads you to come up, uh, come up with a lean light version of implementation, which loses effectiveness. Uh, and then because of that, you either lose momentum or you don't build momentum. So you don't have that, that pace of change and that pace of learning that is necessary to be able to keep going. Um, so there, there again, depending on the situation on the ground, you want to make sure that you have some sort of rapid pace and that you clarify what the expectations and needs are in terms of what you need to do before you progress and get really into, into the race that you're running. And, you know, create that understanding that this is a really long-term race. There are no quick solutions. Right, Mike? That's great. So the way this is work, going to work is uh, we've given you some things to think about, both Angie and Dirk, and um, there's a couple questions here that um, uh, are possible discussion topics. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute the phones if people would like to ask any questions of either Dirk or Angie uh, or weigh in on uh, how these, uh, what they've talked about so far makes sense. You can also use the chat function to share any thoughts or questions. Uh, if there's background noise that gets in the way, I'm gonna have to remute the phones again. So um, I'll just be cognizant of that. So. Um, Let's unmute the phones and uh, think about some of these questions and uh, ponder a little bit about the topics that uh, Andy and Eric have introduced, introduced thus far. <clears throat> One of the things I was thinking about is um, some people have this desire to go see what someone else is doing. They can't seem to get their heads around what this is all about until they they get a view from from uh, what this might look like. Say a site visit at another organization. Maybe it's not even in the same industry. Maybe it is. Um, have you anybody on the call, um, but also Dirk and Angie? Have you had any uh, thoughts about uh, you know, how that does and doesn't work? How that that does and doesn't help? Have you had any? successes or failures about uh, go see opportunities to go see what others have done at the start of the journey. Yes, so this is Dirk. Um, I find it beneficial to, to go to other areas to or other facilities, other companies, organizations to get an idea of what works for them and how things look and to bring people there to see that um, in, a, in, in that context um, to, to help them understand how, how this vision looks um, in reality. You know, if you've talked about the concept and the, and, and, and the vision um, in, in your boardroom, then how do you get people to understand what that looks like in reality? The danger with it, though, is that people just see the surface and not what's behind the surface. The principles and the systems that sit in the background um, and that are not readily or, uh, apparent. Um, and then the, the temptation to simply copy the, uh, what, what is seen in their own facilities without understanding what's sitting behind it. Um, so, you know, as, if, if you can guide that process, then you can control that. But that is one of the risks associated with it. But we also know that a lot of organizations that have been successful with the Lean Transformation did start with lots of benchmark visits to the, 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 the leaders in, in this field around the world uh, in the early part of the journey. So I do think it's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Angie, any thoughts on that or um, 
pond uh, anything on any of the other questions we've got listed out here any more to add um so just to follow up on that um i started um, my journey basically trial by fire um we i was given directive from the ceo to start this new department and start us on this new journey um and we had nothing so from the ground up but he gave me the ability to go on site visits and so i went on visit after visit and i went to many healthcare organizations across our country spoke to their leaders and their um, transformation or lean or continuous improvement departments and people were very gracious and they shared with me their tools but also the thinking behind their tools and, and a little bit of their history and so I was able to take all of that back to the leaders in my organization and talk about who's doing what and why they're doing it and what do we think would actually work and what wouldn't work or what would we maybe modify given that we're at ground zero. So how do we take that concept and apply it right where we're at, which is nowhere. And um, <laughs> so that was super helpful, um, incredibly helpful, but I, I'm pretty sure there are probably most people on the call have already been through all of those stages um, of the journey, the initial stages. But what I was really curious about, and somebody asked this, are there organizations, examples of organizations that have implemented lean from the middle out? And I actually know of two, um, one because a, um, it was from the middle out because that organization was willing, the leadership was willing to bring in continuous improvement, but they weren't really willing to champion it and drive it all the way that senior leaders were like, oh, okay, we'll give you a small budget, um, show us some success and then we'll see what we think. And so that was really, at that middle level, trying to get middle leaders involved, um, that wasn't super successful. The other time that I have seen this is when an organization has tried to have an entire transformation, but it has been successful in some pockets and not as successful in others. And so the pockets where it's been successful, that middle management has carried the torch um, because they found that it's valuable for them and their teams and they got it. And then really, you don't necessarily have an organizational level transformation. Mm -hmm. I think that's great perspective. Um, here's some advice from Virginia. Uh, she says she's found it helpful to get people started in thinking differently, even if it's a different industry. There's also something powerful about talking peer to peer across and not feeling alone in the journey. I think there's some merit to that as well. Absolutely. Okay. Mike? Mike? Yes, please. This is Fabi. Hi. Can I? Yeah, the, one of the, um, I was going to comment about the going to different uh, sites or different uh, the organization to see their lean. One mm -hmm. of the challenges that we have is that uh, it's hard for the leadership to visualize how their lean culture or how their lean system looks like. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's very beneficial for the leadership to go to other organizations that they are established in lean and see how the process works, how does everything functions from the leadership to the lowest level of the organization. And yeah. I I had this experience with uh, when I take when I took one of our uh, leadership to one of the sites that they have gone through lean and they are they had a really mature uh, lean system. And it was kind of eye-opening for him to see how these uh, the concepts and the tools that we are talking about they fit together and create a lean management system. So I think going to different sites, not trying to copy everything, but just seeing how that organization looks like, I think it's, uh, it's really useful and eye-opening. Yeah, I agree with that. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. That's great. So um, I'm going to continue on, and um, we've got some more materials to think about, but you're getting an idea about what we're interested to do here. Um, this is, um, Dirk's going to share some thoughts here on um, what is a lean sensei. 
All right, so um, let's talk about an operational definition. So I've done some scratching and digging around to, to, to find some material that we can all kind of go and look at. Um, so Michael Ballet and, and, and these others wrote this book, The Lean Sensei, Go See Challenge. And then, uh, um, you know, they, they write in there what the role is, etc. So I think that's good reference material. Um, and then John Miller actually did a review of this particular book, and he actually talks about it here. So Sensei is a teacher, essentially, right? So that's, that's the meaning of the word and, and, and the concept. And Lean Sensei should be a master of the tools, methods, and systems of working with people in context-specific communication. Um, so that, that also ties back to, you know, having um, situational leadership uh, awareness and knowledge and, and uh, those kinds of things. And also you need to have a, a knowledge of the history and the development of Lean as such. And then the role is not to give the solution, but to guide the learner in working it out and opening minds. So it's about developing the thinking processes, really, and pushing people to, but it's interesting though, it's about pushing people to find inventive answers to problems through relentless questioning. Um, so that you know, there is quite a lot of pushing or, or, or tugging that is involved here uh, for for this particular role. Um, so that, I, I thought that that was really interesting. Um, I, I think one of the things to to bear in mind here is that you know, as as leader, this is a leadership role in and of its own as well in the organization and you, as, as we talked you know we you work at different levels in the organization so you need to tailor your approach a little bit i mean one of the traps i've fallen into in, in this role in the past as well as also because i've been in an operations management position as a, as, as a leader if there appears to be a bit of a vacuum of leadership i tend to step into it even though i'm there as the as, as the teacher or the sensei guiding them on their improvement journey um, and you need to be careful with, with, with doing that because you, you tend to start setting expectations, very high expectations, and um, you twist the situation and you end up with the leadership responsibility of getting done what needs to get done, whereas it actually should be owned by that local team. So that's just a, um, you know, one of those failures that you need to be aware of. Um, if we, Go to the next slide. I think we've got some something else there. So, um, you know, some background material. What is useful for being a lean sensei? This is just some of the reading that that I've done. Um, so, humble consulting and humble inquiry by Edgar Schein. I found very useful to help frame my own mindset and how to go about uh, my approach with people in this role. Um, and then uh, more recently, I've been reading Kaizen Forever and the Team Jutsu uh, Kaizen uh, texts uh, by uh, Bob Emiliani and others that describe the teaching of Jiro Nakao and how he went about um, conducting himself as a Lean Sensei, as an external Lean Sensei. And these, these two, uh, two books are very interesting because they're kind of written for people like ourselves to coach us and teach us and help us reflect on what we could do better. So I just wanted to reference that out there for you uh, so you've got something to look at. Um, let's talk about the, the role of the Lean Sensei. As, as, as you can see here, um, a little pilot boat next to a um, seagoing ship. Um, this is an analogy I'd like to use, and it's personal to me. My late father was, in, in the beginning of his career, a harbor pilot in the harbor of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, one of the busiest and most advanced ports in the world. And the role of the pilot is to bring ships from the open sea through the channels to its mooring at the, at the key or the wharf where it needs to go to unload its cargo um, in a safe manner. So the, the idea here is the pilot climbs on board while the ship is still at sea, about to enter the harbor. And then the pilot tells the captain and his crew uh, how to sail their ship through the channels to get to where they need to go safely. And the, the idea here is this, the captain and the crew still are responsible for the functioning of the ship and getting the ship where it needs to go safely. But they need that expertise of the local pilot who knows the waters, who knows the currents, uh, the, the, the local procedures and rules, et cetera, instructing them so they can actually execute their tasks um, correctly. So 
So I thought it was just an interesting analogy, and obviously that person who speaks to you. And with that, then, you know, if we think about this overall race, well, one of the things we need to be careful of is ambling into ambiguity. You know, this whole idea of, of, of leadership gaps and so on, right? Um, so what I want to talk about here is uh, the lack of clarity and leadership expectations and how demanding you should be or should not be as a coach. And I think that is a, that is a delicate balance. You know, sometimes I've overreached and I've been too demanding, and other times, and, you know, I've, I've been told that by the people that I've worked with. So you just need to be conscious of that. But other times, you need to be maybe firmer than you think you need to be. Um, I've, I've been told that as well. Yeah, so I've, you could have applied some more tough love in certain situations in order to uh, prod the team along to do the next right thing that needs to be done. So that's something to, to be uh, concerned about and think about. Okay, righteous rigor, right? The dilemma of being right versus effective. Um, we've had lots of interesting discussions about that. And I think, you know, the key thing here is it's important for us as practitioners to be fairly firm in adhering to principles. But in terms of our approach, we need to be really careful that we tailor the approach to the situation while staying anchored in the principles in the background. I think that's probably the wisest way to go forward because if you're very rigorous in your approach and people don't get it, you're just gonna put them off. And then you're not gonna be able to make progress with, with the people that you're trying to coach. Another pitfall is pursuing the problem, right? Is the problem the problem? I've been in situations where I've been asked to facilitate a team working on a problem that had been uh, defined and supposedly diagnosed, only to find out halfway through the investigation that the presented problem wasn't the problem at all, right? And that goes together with the next point of getting vacuumed into the vortex. As, as a problem solver myself, I get pretty excited about the problems and solving them. It's very satisfying to do that. I'm kind of wired that way. So I have to watch out that I don't fall into that, that uh, maelstrom of the, of, of the problem solving myself and stay in the background and let the team actually do the problem solving and figure out whether the, the problem that they have is actually the problem or not, or if they should be looking at something else. So, you know, there needs to be a good understanding, therefore, of what the responsibility and accountability is of the uh, Lean Sensei or the, or the Lean Transformation Facilitator. And oftentimes that's misunderstood, right? So people think that, and this often comes with the Lean or the Six Sigma um, Black Belt idea that, well, you own, the, uh, you own the project and therefore you, you're accountable for the deliverables. And in a, in a true lean transformation context, that's not really true. And that's not the position we need to be in. Our, our role is to equip people, develop people to be able to solve problems and drive the team's improvement. Um, so that, that, is, that is something that I've come across uh, that has happened. I've got several examples where uh, problems were presented that weren't really the problem. Uh, but it was possible to figure that out. The one countermeasure to this would be to actually uh, develop project charters, have the team develop a project charter beforehand, so you can actually test and probe to see if the problem that's presented truly is the problem or not, and how deeply and well the problem is understood or not. Another thing I think that, um, especially for me, uh, that I need to be careful of is, you know, I, I do a lot of thinking about this stuff, and then a lot of thinking leads up leads to bent up thoughts, which which then turns into me asking a lot of questions at one, at, at once uh, of a certain person if I'm working with with an individual or a team on something, which then completely overwhelms them. And then the even more dangerous thing in that context is, and it's difficult sometimes if you are remote from your sites uh, and not always there, is doing this by email. So be very careful when you're corresponding with email and you're raising questions in order to prompt thinking, which is your legitimate role as a Lean Sensei, but that you don't overwhelm them with a whole page full of questions. Kind of take it one step at a time. Um, I've fallen into that trap uh, in, in the past several times. Um, the other, uh, just in closing then, uh, as, as a role, uh, 
how do you approach things? Are, are you going to be the rapid revolutionary or the, or the cautious, calculating, challenging, and caring coach? And you know, what do we mean by that? You know, as as we progress in this role, we tend to be in a position where we can connect the dots fairly easily because of the thinking process and the mindset that we have and the knowledge that we've obtained over the years relative to the situation that is in front of us. So if we're interacting with, with leaders of one kind or another, whether it's middle management or senior leaders, it is very easy to start pointing out the defects in the current situation. Um, but be careful with that because you're going to get a lot of defensiveness and pushback because they don't have the same perspective as you do. Um, so it's probably safer and better to use a more calculating uh, and caring approach and the questions to challenge the situation so your audience can discover for themselves and draw their own conclusions what potentially the problems are with the current situation uh, without you actually telling them so. All right, and I'll hand over to Angie from here. So one of the big components of our role is in fact coaching and we can find ourselves coaching along a variety of things um, because in order to make gains in continuous improvement it could be they need coaching with just using Excel or how to use a gate chart or what some of the tools are they might need coaching around the concepts they might need coaching about you know, how to engage their team members, um, how to ask for things of their senior leaders. So coaching is a huge role for us. And also sometimes, depending on your organization's um, approach, you may be lucky enough that senior leadership has also decided that they would actually like you to coach them and they will call it coaching. Um, and so I'm talking about coaching in that more formal sense where your organization is actually looking at you as a coach and you set aside time to do coaching. Um, so I have a couple of experiences that were different, but they built upon each other um, potentially because I grew. So some of the successes that I'm about to talk about were because of the experiences I was allowed to have and then bring to other situations. So in the first company that I worked at in this role, I was able to coach the executive team. And part of why I was able to do that is because this was a top-down approach. And also because the executive team did not know anything about lean. So all I really had to do was be one step ahead in my knowledge of the from the executive team and also take our vision and figure out how to translate our vision into what they needed to know, kind of as they needed to know it to lead the organization towards that vision. Um, so that was very successful, at least I thought at the time, but I was new. Um, and so I grew from that, but when I went to the next company, I knew that executives could be interested in being coached and could have success with it if if we did it right if we got their buy-in if we could get them to agree so in the second company i worked for we did not start out with the c-suite having coaches but we did a redesign and during that redesign the executives agreed to have coaches from our team and they also agreed to go ahead and be the first leaders that went through training around our redesign. And we also decided to use this, the Shingo model as our approach. So many organizations I've worked in have not had a model that they're basing their, I don't even know what you call it, management system or their, their actual system for lean or system for Six Sigma is just, is just bits and pieces pulled together of tools that people have brought from other companies or where they feel their organization is at, but they don't have anything 
to compare that to. They don't have a model to compare that to or a model that informs what their system looks like or how they develop. So in this case, this company decided to go ahead and use the shingle model for their redesign. And part of the shingle model has that foundation um, that's built on culture, the cultural foundation, and that's built on respect and trust and humility. And so these senior leaders actually decided that yes, we could have a class on respect, trust and humility. And then they also put into that, um, what do those behaviors look like? And then how do we go exhibit them at GEMBA? And they created standard work for GEMBA. And then on top of that, they wanted training on the Socratic method because a big failure that we had had at that organization previously was saying we were using the Socratic method, but really it was a game of 20 questions until that leader failed. Um, and so that was not setting up a good culture. And so we went, um, we had training around the Socratic method and humble inquiry and what good questions are versus questions that leave people feeling defeated or leaving people feeling as if they had just been part of the inquisition. So um, those were some of the failings that that organization had. They learned off of them. They did a redesign and I was able to then use all that in coaching. So the tremendous success was that we actually then had a model around what we're coaching and the C-suite became part of the coaches when they went became the coaches as they went out to Gemba and we went with them and we were their coaches. Part of what made that work is allowing time before going to Gemba to ask the senior leader, what are you looking for? Um, what is it we're going to accomplish? What questions are you going to ask? How do we frame those? And then afterwards, reflecting on how did we do? So really being attentional around that was super successful, but that was only successful because it was built on failings. The third bullet point that I have on here is actually doing. So as Dirk mentioned a couple times, it is easy to get caught up into the vortex um, of stepping into leadership roles when there are shortages in leadership staffing or shortages in leadership skills or shortages in leadership time. And so it's hard to be a good coach when you're doing um, and you're not actually in a sensei role necessarily when you're doing. We're not setting them up for being able to take over, um, should take over for themselves, should something happen to their resource. However, I have this on the side because I currently am finding myself in a very much doing role within an ED. And that is not typical, it's not really typical in my career, but I wanted to put it on here because this particular ED has not had lean training, lean support, they haven't had a sensei before, so they don't really understand the roles and responsibilities. But not only that, they couldn't do it if they wanted to because of their staffing and because of all the challenges and change they're already undergoing for other reasons. However, what I've been able to do, so obviously a failure is that I'm doing a lot of this, but I've been able to create buy-in. I've been able to create value. People can see the value of the things that I'm doing because things are changing for the better for them. So what I've been able to do is I've been able to ask for partners on the different things that I'm working on and I've been working at a strategic level with the leaders and then at a doing level asking for partners from the hands-on teammates at the bedside. So it is working in a much different way and people are learning about lean, they're learning about the concepts, they're learning about problem solving, they're learning about flow, they're learning about waste, they're learning about removing the waste, but it is very much I am right alongside them. I'm actually doing most of it and taking them with me um, 
and it's actually been more successful than I would like to admit. That's interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Angie. Thanks for sharing all of it. Um, the phones are um, still, oh wait, we've got another um, slide here. All right, so engaging senior, senior leadership, right? So uh, in addition to what Angie was talking about, I just want to touch on a few things here. I mean, this is a lot of content here and there's probably more here than we can talk about right now. Um, so the challenge here is, and only, also in my own experience, is that in many, many organizations, the senior leadership is not engaged, right? And there are many reasons for that. Um, one of it, one, some of them not engaging the right leaders as the lean practitioners and senseis in terms of roles, not tying things to an overall strategic objective, you know, working on things at random, not addressing emerging concerns or ideas in the executive language, uh, not having clearly agreed cases for change and connecting it to a higher level objective for the organization and vision and not connecting the transformation idea and ideals to existing supported values and ideals that already uh, are in, distributed throughout the organization to start off with. But even if you did that, um, that's probably still not good enough. And why do I say that? Well, you know, with, with the experiences that I've had in working with executives um, th throughout my career, um, I, I've always found this resistance to, to, to change the way they do things. And, you know, we're also trying to follow here where I'm now the, a version of the Shingo model with the principles and, and behaviors driven through systems. Um, and even, you know, with the exercises that, that we've done to try to change thinking through activities, things are not always uh, getting hooked and moving along, right? If you think of B.J. Fogg's uh, behavior change model, where he talks about you need, you need to have the motivation, the person needs to have the ability, and there needs to be a trigger, and all three have to be present at the same time for a behavior to occur. So if you want new behaviors, you know, is there a trigger? So even if you put triggers in place like we've tried, um, is the ability there? But we've conducted the training, and we've taken people through experiences, so an ability is there, uh, so that, that's in place. So then what's left? Well, what about the motivation? And that's what I want to talk about here. Um, so, you know, generally in industry, if you look at it, 30 years of, of unengaged senior leadership as far as um, transitioning from classical um, management thinking to lean management thinking, why is that? Um, so I've been thinking about that and I've been reading up on that. So Bob Emiliano wrote this, uh, this book, The Triumph of Classical Management Over Lean Management, How Tradition Prevails and What to Do About It. And this was like a, a, a bucket of cold water over my head as a lean thinker. Um, it, it really made me think. Um, Bob and I talked about this. And there, there are no straight answers, but one of the challenges is, do we as lean practitioners and senseis really understand where senior, senior leadership is coming from and what their mindset is, why it is so, and why it is so strongly entrenched? Bob addresses that in his book, so I'm not going to go into the details here, but it is an elephant in the room. And it would be really beneficial for us as lean practitioners to understand this more deeply so we can get a, a better a grip on how we can use tools such as the farm behavior model, such as motivational interviewing, the coaching approach that Angie was talking about uh, to help senior executives uh, get a better understanding of what the potential is of lean transformation and why it matters um, and to try to overthrow the, the deeply entrenched classical thinking that exists. Thanks for that. I'm going to take another pause here. I noticed in the uh, chat uh, section that Angie has some perspective on a question that CJ asked. So Angie, um, you got it again. Thank you. So um, CJ said that going to C was really useful in the beginning. Now we are grateful for the few learners that really grasp the lean concepts and use them in a few of their management skills, but never get a whole department functioning as a lean unit. Changing a culture does not happen overnight. 
And I have felt and seen this through my entire career where we get a couple people that are interested um, maybe at a management level either, but the whole department never really functions as a lean unit. And I did happen to have this crazy experience. Um, it was in that redesign I was talking about where in the training that we rolled out with um, the concepts that we really wanted to highlight and focus on and how we were going to operationalize that at that organization, we put four different classes together around the four different things we were going to focus on, um, what lean meant to us, basically, how we were going to do it. And we had every single department go through that training, the leaders of that department. So the VP was part of the executive team. They went first, but then they came and supported their leaders, the directors, the managers and the supervisors all came to this training. But what was really cool about it is they came together. So that department had to pick what day they were going to training number one and what day they were going to training number two. And so they had to come as a department and then with their vice president sitting there talking to them during the breaks or work sessions that we gave them, this is what I'm hoping this looks like. This is what I expect to see when I come to Gemba. This is how I'll support you. That was the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my entire career and it worked. And you could go out to those um, departments and you could see that the leaders went back and implemented it and they also shared it with their team. Does that mean every single team member knew how to do a 5Y and did it every day? No, but I will say they knew that we were using it. They knew that we were trying to get to the root cause of problems. Like it, it was truly spectacular, but that's the only time I've ever seen it. And it was an incredibly deliberate approach. Thanks for sharing that, Angie. That's really terrific. We've got about three minutes left and I want to make sure that we spend a bit of time on these uh, slides here. Um, this is a slide that Dirk wants to say a bit about, and then I got a slide for Angie, so. All right, so let's quickly work through that. Um, so when you're building an internal team, and you know, it depends on your situation and how you're going about with your approach and some things to think about um, and some lessons learned as well. You know, you need to be clear on what the role is of, or, of what your lean senseis and your facilitators, etc., do uh, in your lean transformation or Kaizen promotion office. Um, so one of the challenges here is that, uh, you know, initially when if, if lean transformation is, is not fully understood, you're going to face the obstacle of being rationed on the resources that you have available, either directly in your own department or that you can. Um, sub out to the rest of the organization as you start developing people in the organization that may become point persons or lead persons in their own area and become um, the, the go-to persons for those teams to help them with their improvements and so forth. So, you know, you start developing trainers in, in uh, distributed areas in the organization. Um, the other challenge is, you know, do you bring in ex outside experts and, and in what kind and for what for skill. So again, it depends on how many people can you initially afford to appoint and what scope do they have in terms of skills and what can they cover in whatever approach you're taking. You know, if you're taking a model cell approach, can the team that you have uh, support, support that model cell activities and the follow up of the implementation of those activities and you know, in, in the past, we, we've struggled with, with those kinds of things because new things come up on our horizon. And now that activity that has taken place, that Kaizen event has taken place, now has no support to help them in the completion of the aftermath of the Kaizen. Um, so those are some risks that you need to be uh, aware of that you need to be able to cover uh, with your team. So then the question becomes, what is it you do with your in internal team and what is it that you farm out? You know, so development of training materials. Um, you know, do you do that yourself based on your own history and experiences, et cetera, that people have brought in from elsewhere and then develop your own? Or do you just simply go to somebody like Gemba Academy and just 
integrate what they already have as a prepackaged thing or customized thing together with what you want to do so you don't have to worry about that aspect of it. Um, so the, those are, there's some trade-offs there. Uh, other things you need to uh, be able to think about is how do you integrate with the rest of the organization so that you're not a peripheral function that's doing yet another thing uh, with, with the uh, teams in the organization and training them in various things and developing skills with them. So what we've done, for instance, uh, more recently is we've partnered with uh, our, let's call it our training department, uh, which is separate from our office, and we've integrated with them now. So some of our training workshops that we run, we run through them, they market it, et cetera, and they help us also with the compilation of the materials. And so it becomes more of a central thing rather than just a lean transformation office thing. Um, and then the question comes up, so how do you grow the team? Now, obviously, you want to create fishers out there. So you want to have people that you can face back in the organization. So I think a good model there is to have people that you bring into the, uh, your team for a while, train them as facilitators through experience, and then rotate them back into the organization and make that part of the motion track for them. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thanks, Dirk. Some final thoughts here from Angie on uh, this slide, and then I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick here. So you can see some of the things where I felt like I've seen some failures um, is around learning and spread. Um, for example, just within our own team, it's really hard to learn from each other if we can't find anything in our computer files, if people are storing things in a bunch of different places in your system or on their own computers. Um, Everyone does the same thing differently. So learning from each other on how we facilitate, um, people bring different experiences to the background and, from, and backgrounds, so learning from each other. And then also when we spread, like I might do something great at one facility and someone else may want to do the same thing at their facility, but if they take the exact standard I've created at my facility and try to spread it at another, it may not be that successful because that facility may have a completely different environment, different staffing levels, different volumes, different space layouts. So those are some things internally we've um, been challenged with. We've also been challenged with who is coaching us as senseis. Do we get external consultants to come in and coach us? Sometimes the leaders that we have within our own department have less experience than we have. Um, so that's been a challenge. Another thing is a lot of times we team members in our department would like to move into operations in healthcare, but HR doesn't understand our functions very well. And sometimes we're used really differently from one team to another. So they may not understand that we do have budgeting experience. We do have staffing experience. We do have a lot of operations. In fact, we are coaching their operational leaders, um, but yet it's hard for us to get a job in operations. Um, sometimes I think that part of that is we're in healthcare and there are a lot of nurse requirements for leadership positions. Um, I'm not gonna say whether or not that's right or wrong, but that's also another barrier we have. And then lastly, who is improving the lean management system? Is that PEC? Is that middle management that we're working with? Is that the executives of the organization? And how do we find that balance so that the improvements that we're making still hold true to lean concepts and still get us moving and improving, um, but yet simple enough and meet the needs of our customers? So that's it. Thanks, Angie. And I know we covered uh, those last topics quickly. We really could have taken any one of these subsections and devoted a whole hour to it, which is possibly what we'll do in the future. So uh, thanks again for our presenters for putting this information together uh, for me and with us. Um, so what happens next, this recording is going to be available for others to share. So if you go to our website and you can see where the previous event uh, are stored, um, I also send it out to the people that participated in our distribution list, so you'll have that as well. Um, in May, uh, Didier Rubino was going to do a presentation on frontline leader standard work. Um, he couldn't do it then, and uh, we're looking for a time in 2020 for that to happen. Uh, in January, so starting the new year, uh, Ken Eakin, a friend uh, who uh, lives in Canada, uh, has written a book called Office Lean, and he's going to be talking about some of the key concepts from that book, and uh, you can learn more about that. You can Go to the bit.ly link and learn about the dial-in login, uh, and you can check out Amazon with uh, Ken's book. I'm in the middle of reading it. I really like it. 
Um, in February, uh, Kevin McNamara, who's done a couple webinars for us, has some updates on his uh, experiments in um, leader standard work, and he calls it personal management system. And so that'll be in February. I'm looking forward to that. He's always willing to share what he's personally experimenting with. He's a great role model for what this looks like. And as the CEO of a growing company, um, he's someone that um, shares freely with others and learns deeply. So um, he's a, a really great role model for that. Uh, in April, uh, Jason Shulist um, is a president of a company um, that um, he, the Generative Local Community Initiative, I've presented at a couple of their annual events called uh, Skills Fest, and uh, Jason is going to talk about using adaptive problem solving on some of those thorny community problems. And uh, it's an interesting concept that I think um, you would benefit from learning more about, um, and uh, he's going to be sharing that in April. So, as always, I've got some topics in the works, and as you saw from today's presentation, some of those take a while to, to get developed, which is fine, um, and always looking for other examples. Uh, just a quick update here. In January of last year, we started the Principle of the Month Reflection, both available on our blog post on our IEX website, but also uh, through LinkedIn. And every week, there's a reflection on a principle. So in January, it was uh, constancy of purpose. February, we did respect every individual. March, we did focus on process. So you can go to these bit.ly link as, and see what we talked about then, or you can just go to the website and browse yourself. April, create value for the customer. May was lead with humility. Assure quality at the source was June. Think systemic why. In August, we talked about learn continuously. September, flow and pull value. October, understand and manage variation. And um, embracing scientific thinking was in November. And we've just um, had one reflection so far on uh, seek perfection. And so it's handy that there's 12 months and there's 12 principles that we're focusing on. So it's worked out nicely. Um, so, uh, as, you, as you saw from this webinar, if you have an idea for something you think would be interesting and you'd like to share your perspective, you can see how it works. And I, again, appreciate Angie and Dirk taking the time to work with me on this. I thought it was a great presentation. And um, so, again, thank you for that. Uh, we've run, run a little bit over, so um, I'm just going to shut it down right now and hope everyone has a good day. Um, have a good week. Uh, I guess the week has ended. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you uh, in 2020. Take Thanks, Mike. You bet. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.